Morning, church. Good morning. Worship to, welcome to worship this morning, to be in the house of the Lord in this beautiful sanctuary. It's a gift to all of us. And uh, before we... So last Sunday, we didn't just start the season of Advent. We also started a new church year. The first Sunday, Sunday of Advent is the beginning of a new church year, which makes sense because the church is the body of Christ. And, of course, we celebrate Christ's birth at the beginning of the new church year. And we learned last week, as we looked at the scriptures, as we started this, this season of Advent, and as we started this new church year, um, looking at seeking God's face as we begin these new seasons, this new year in the church, and, and what it means to seek God's face, what it means to behold God's face, what it means that God's face would shine upon us. And what we learned that in scripture, when we see the, the term God's face, what it really means is the presence, the presence of God. And of course, this wouldn't be possible at all for us to seek God's face, to seek God's presence, if God himself had not come to us in the form of a baby, in, in human form, in Jesus Christ the Lord. He allowed himself to be laid in this crude manger. He allowed himself 33 years later to be laid on a cruel cross to save you and me and to open up the way for us so that we could be in a relationship with God, so that we could be present with him as he is always present with us. Jesus came to, to help us to know God. He came to help us love God. I mean, we can't love someone that we don't know. Jesus came to help us to know God and to love God and also to be present with God through the power of the Holy Spirit. And so as we begin the season of Advent, this new church year, last week we were challenged to seek his face, to seek his face. Let's pray together. Almighty and glorious and gracious God, we come we come submitting to the truth of your word. We come because you came for us. Help us to hear. Lift us out of ruts that take us nowhere but where we've been before. Lift us to you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So for those of us who make presents or who buy presents to give to people at Christmas time, I think it's true that we all want to give something that is meaningful, right? I mean, for my siblings, I'm, I'm always looking for something that reminds us of our parents. Our parents are both gone, and, and so for my two sisters and my brother, I, I often am looking for something special that will remind us together of our parents. And after all, it is the main thing that we have in common. So last month when John and I were down in Asheville at the um, Billy Graham Training Center at that conference, we had a couple hours before the conference started on Monday. And so we went down into um, what was called Biltmore Village, and we were looking for a place that we could get some lunch. And as we were walking by a storefront, there was a poster on this storefront that was advertising the amazing bacon cooker. The amazing bacon cooker. Now, for those of, you, those of you who have been around me for a little while, for a number of years over Christmas time, you know that bacon is an important tradition in our, uh, in our household on Christmas morning. So we couldn't eat, t open our stockings, we couldn't open any presents until everybody ate a bacon sandwich. Just bacon on plain white bread. That's the way it had to be. And so and in various ways, um, all of my siblings, we have all um, shared, continued to share that tradition. In fact, um, last year, one of my siblings sent me this um, bacon ornament to hang <laughs> on our tree. Yeah, it's not really a slab of bacon, it's porcelain, but I stuck it over in there. So when I saw this advertised on the, the window, the amazing famous bacon cooker, I was like, ooh, this is exciting. So we went in and we saw what they are and I'll, um, that's what they look like. This is the amazing bacon cooker. And so let's look at the next picture. 
So what you do is you drape bacon over the edges of this, and then the bacon, the grease drips down into the little trough, and then you've got the little spout so you can pour the grease off. And uh, so we looked at these, and they were reasonably priced, which I was very happy about. And so it's like, okay, so um, maybe this is what we'll, you know, get for my siblings for Christmas. So we went on to the conference, and then we came back to this place after, after the conference was over. And the place was a whole lot bigger than uh, we realized the first time. And there were these um, these famous bacon cookers were everywhere, every I mean, every color you can imagine. But then I walked around the corner, and there was a display of the famous bacon cooker that had a little ladybug on the top of the handle. Now, maybe that doesn't mean anything to you. It probably doesn't. But a ladybug is a symbol that my siblings and I use for my mom because she directed a singing group called the Ladybugs when we were in elementary school and junior high. So to find a famous bacon cooker with a ladybug on it, I mean, this was like fate, right? It's exciting when we can find the right gift for the people that we want to honor, right? I mean, nobody wants to just go out there and buy something for the sake of buying something. We want to find something that is meaningful to the people that we are honoring with the gift. Now, Jesus, of course, we know this. We're, we're Christians. We know that Jesus is the very best gift that God could ever give to us. We know that. And we know that this is what Christmas is all about. This is what Christmas is all about. That's why it's called Christmas. Even though in stores people are trying to say happy holidays, what are they trying to do? They're trying to forget that it's really about Jesus. It's about Jesus Christ. It's, it's Christmas. It's Christmas. This is what Jesus, this is what it's all about. And so there's no greater gift that God could give to us than the person of Jesus Christ to save us from our sins. But the question today is then, what is the greatest gift that we can give back to him? The wise men brought him gifts of what? Gold, frankincense, and myrrh, practical gifts. And then the shepherds, the shepherds gave him the gift of, his pres of their presence. They left their fields and they came to be with him. The gift of presence, not T-S, but presence. They took time to be with him. But let's look at the scriptures to see what it is that the angels gave to him. In that region, there were shepherds living in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. And then an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for see, I am bringing you good news of great joy for all the people. To you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign for you. You will find a child wrapped in bands of cloth and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth peace among those whom he favors. Then when the angels had left them and gone on into heaven, the shepherds said to each other, Let's go now to Bethlehem and see this thing that has taken place, which the Lord has made known to us. So of all the things, all the things, think about it, that the angels could have given to Jesus, what they gave to him was the very best gift that any of us can give to him, the gift of our worship, the gift of worship. For suddenly, one angel was joined by thousands of angels as they lifted their voices, praising God, saying, Oh God, you are glorious. Glory to God in the highest heaven for what you have done here for the people on earth. They worshipped. Now, what is worship? Worship happens when we are giving worth to something or someone. Worship happens any time, worship of God happens any time that we are acknowledging God, even by saying a simple thank you for something small or, or maybe for something very big. Worship happens when we turn off the TV and turn on Christmas music, Christ-centered music instead. Worship happens when we take time to open our Bibles and read God's word. Worship happens when we set our alarm on Saturday night so that we make sure that we don't miss being together with the people of God on Sunday night. That's an act of worship. Worship of God can happen anywhere, anytime. In your living room, 
in your car or in your truck in the middle of the woods, at your desk, at school, in a hospital room, on the line, at work, in the middle of a busy store, not just here on Sunday mornings. Worship can happen anywhere, anytime. Now, we looked last week at the encounter that Jesus had with the woman at the well, and we're going to go back there and see something else that Jesus said there. He said, but the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for the Father seeks such as these to worship him. The Father is seeking those who will worship him. The thing is, we all worship something or someone I mean, everybody, even infants, give ultimate worth to something or someone. Everyone is drawn into believing things like this, that when this thing happens, then I'll be happy. So we put ultimate worth on that thing. Or when that thing happens, then then my life will be blessed. Or when I get my driver's license, then life will be perfect. Or when this semester is over, I'll or I finish this degree, or I I get into that school, life is going to be just what I want it to be. Because we're so prone to, to counting on things, or counting on events, or counting on people to carry us, to deliver us, to entertain us, to fulfill us, or to give us peace. But here's the truth. That no relationship, no special relationship, not even a marriage relationship ultimately can give us these things, can carry us, can deliver us, can entertain us or fulfill us or give us peace. No career can do that for us. A particular education can't do that for us. A a physically fit body can't do that for us. Retirement doesn't do that for us. Having a baby doesn't do that for us. Or having another baby doesn't do that for us. Having something turn out the way we have wanted it to turn out, something that we've fought for for years, even that, when it comes to pass, doesn't do it for us. Having our favorite team win a Big Ten championship, even that doesn't do it for us long term. And certainly having the perfect Christmas tree or finding the perfect Christmas gifts, these things, they do not do this for us. They cannot carry us and deliver us, fulfill us, and give us peace. Now, worship might not be the word that you would use for these things when we, are, when we are trying to describe what we automatically or give ultimate worth to. And we might not use the word worship. But anytime we are trusting someone or something to give us life or to give us meaning or to give us peace or to give us joy, then we're on the edge, folks. Or maybe we're full out worshiping that person or that thing because we are ascribing an unhealthy worth to it. Because here's the thing, when, even when we make good things, they can be really good things, but when we make them the ultimate things, the things that we must have or we will not be happy, we will always, always, always be disappointed. The best gift that we can give to Jesus And the way it works out is the best gift that we can give to ourselves at the same time. This Christmas, this church year, this month, this day, this very minute is the gift of worship. The gift that the angels gave to Jesus. I mean, of all the things that they could have given, of all the things that they could have given, they gave worship and then then they just went back to heaven, it says. They just came and they worshiped and then they just went back into heaven. Look at this verse from um, the paraphrase of scripture, The Voice. It says, at once the angel was joined by a huge angelic choir, singing God's praises, glory to God in the heavenly heights, peace to all men and women on earth who please him. See, that's how it works. The angels sang praises to God, and then they declared peace over those of us who choose to please him by doing the same. 
Okay, they gave worship to God, and then they, they, they spoke a blessing over those of us who choose to please God by doing the same, also by worshiping the Lord. Because when we choose to worship God above everything else that we're tempted to put in first place, we have peace. We have peace. We have peace that starts down in the soles of our feet, and we, it can, we cannot be shaken when we have that kind of peace. And this, folks, is one of the main reasons that, that the church exists, is to bring people together, to bring you and me together to, to praise and to, to worship God, not because God needs our worship, because God knows that we need to worship him, because we're going to worship something. We need the church to remind us that, that we're called to worship God Almighty. And anybody who says that they believe in Jesus and yet they reject connecting with his body, the church, for corporate worship is buying into one of the greatest lies that Satan whispers into people's ears, which is this, I don't need anyone or anything else. I can worship God all by myself. You heard that? You've heard it in your own heads, I'm sure, and you've heard other people say it. And it's true, actually. We can worship God all by ourselves. We're called to in day-to-day -day practice. But long-term, it cannot be biblically sustained in spirit and in truth, apart from the accountability and the encouragement of the body of Christ. Because God calls us to worship him together, together. I mean, did you notice God sent one angel to make the pronouncement as to what had happened, and then he sent a whole host of angels together to worship. We're called to be together. Glory to God in the highest heaven. There's something that happens, isn't there? When we worship God together. I mean, when I hear you singing and when I hear you lifting your voices in, in prayer to God, it, it does something inside of me. It stirs my soul, it gives me strength, and it gives me courage, and it gives me hope, and it gives me peace, it, it feeds me, it reminds me, this is who I am. This is what I am. I am God's child. I am part of the family of God. I belong here. These are my people, because together, Jesus Christ is our Lord. And so as you, as you worship, it inspires me to worship, and it, that's the way it goes. Worship inspires worship inspires worship. And so on this second Sunday of Advent, a day when we have lit a candle of peace, I challenge you to give Jesus the gift that the angels gave him, to give him the gift of worship. So, this happened at the first service. I got all froggy right here. So we were at, when we were at this conference, the, um, the final night that we were there, the worship leader taught us a song. It's a very simple song that um, they often sing at the end of conferences there, and I figured if, if it was good enough for the Billy Graham Training Center, I thought it might be something that w would maybe inspire us as well. So with this theme in mind, worshiping God 24-7, here's the song. So it takes some motions, too. So this hand serves as like the horizon, okay? From the rising of the sun to the going down of the same, the name of the Lord shall be praised from the rising of the sun to the going down of the same. The name of the Lord shall be praised. Just a simple song. I invite you to stand and let's sing it together. And let's decide which way the sun is going to rise on. Because at 8.30, the sun was going that way, and the sun was going that way. So we're going to rise this way, okay? Uh-oh. That means I have to switch. Oh, this is bad. Okay, you ready? From the rising of the sun to the going down of the same. The name of the Lord 
shall be praised from the rising of the sun to the going down of the same. The name of the Lord shall be praised. Isn't that wonderful? You may be seated.